Zayden POV, Fourth Wing, by Bell Beebe. Chapter 5. Battle Brief You'd think it would be the dragons and daggers that will kill you here, but ever since first year, I've been convinced it's battle brief that will be the death of me. It takes every ounce of self-control to hold my tongue, as the professors prattle through supposedly unbiased reports from operations on our borders. One wrong word in here, and you're dead. It's nice to stand at the back of the room for once, the front seats of the auditorium crammed with the new intake of cadets. It gives me the sensation that I could slip out any second, even though listening to this Navarian propaganda each day is as compulsory as ever. I lean back against the wall, knowing it won't be long before I'll be forced into taking back a seat. People die so frequently around here, no one's left standing at the sidelines for long. I cross my arms and tilt my head back, waiting for anyone to say anything, the remote bit interesting. Every day in Battle Brief, it's the same inane questions and the same evasive answers, none of them getting any of us closer to the truth. What we should all actually be asking is why the fuck are command keeping the Venin secret when the wards are failing? Why are they withholding the only supplies that could give our neighbors' armies an edge before the threat reaches us? What the hell are the Venin searching for in every village they attack? The first few months are the worst, as the first years get used to the brutal repetition of it all. It doesn't matter how many riders are dead or injured, how many griffins were killed, or how long it took them to rebuild the wards. None of it matters because it's all built on a shit heap of lies. It's only when I hear someone ask what altitude the village is at that my interest is piqued. My head snaps up and strains to see who it came from in the front few rows where the first years sit, worried it might be one of ours. I can't see who asked the question until the professors turn to ask why she wants to know. It's Rhiannon that adds, Just seems a little high for a planned attack with griffins. It's an astute observation. And then I notice the silver-tipped braid of the girl sat right next to her as she turns to say something in her ear. Of course, it was a good question. It came from the girl destined to be a scribe. It is a little high for a planned attack, Professor Devera says. Why don't you tell me why that's bothersome, Cadet Sorengail? And maybe you'd like to ask your own questions from here on out. If she was trying to keep a low profile, she's failed spectacularly. Every person in the room swivels to look straight at her. I watch with interest as she logics it out, careful and considered. She makes no assumptions checks her facts and questions everything. Then they were already on their way, she concludes, and my brows rise in surprise at how quickly she made the connection. Laughter ripples round the first years, and even from here I can tell her cheeks have flushed with embarrassment. But she's right. The dragons knew the wards were breaking and mobilised the unit. I can't help but think that Brennan might have undersold how smart his little sister really is. I let the other riders share their questions, waiting for the best moment to ask the most important one. What was the condition of the village? I ask, when the professors start to shuffle papers together on the desk. Rearson? Markham asks, slightly surprised. I so rarely contribute at these things, but I want to set an example to the other rebellion kids on how to ask a question that gives us information that we can use. The village, I repeat. Professor de Vera said the damage would have been worse, but what was the actual condition? Was it burned? Destroyed? They wouldn't demolish it if they were trying to establish a foothold, so the condition of the village matters when trying to determine a motive for the attack. Keep it just vague enough. Shut off obvious avenues for lies. Ask questions within questions to get more than a yes-no response. Professor de Vera smiles and says, The buildings they'd already gone through were burned and the rest were being looted when the wing arrived. They were looking for something, I decide. And it wasn't riches. That's not a gem mining district. Which begs the question, what do we have that they want so badly? Exactly, that's the question. Professor Devera nods at me in approval, looking round the room. And that right there is why Riorson is a wing leader. You need more than strength and courage to be a good rider. My eyes lock with Liam's across the hall, 
who bows his head and slow claps me mockingly. I roll my eyes. I'm still dripping in sweat as I trudge back to my room after flight field that day, toweling myself off as I go and desperate for a bath. But as I turn the corner, I see Garrick and Imogen locked in a heated argument outside my door, his hands gripped tight on both her shoulders, and know it's still a long way off. These two just need to get together already. She fucking deserved it, I hear Imogen hiss at him as I get closer. Besides, I don't answer to you. Garrick finally spots me over her shoulder and nods in my direction. That's still debatable, but you definitely answer to him. Imogen turns her head to look at me, murder in her eyes. This is going to be a long night. I'll get the popcorn, Scale says with a snort. I don't acknowledge them, just unlock the door and gesture them inside. Imogen plonks down on the bed, her arms crossed tight across her chest. Garrick pulls out a chair to sit on the other side of the room, his foot tapping the ground. I'm left standing in between them to mediate. Brilliant. When neither of them speaks, I turn to Imogen. Well? She just rolls her eyes at me sullenly and takes out one of her daggers, using it to clean under her nails. She's never been one to break first. Okay, then. I turn to the other side of the room. Garrick. You want to tell me what this is about? She put the Sorengale girl in the infirmary, he says, his eyes locked on Imogen. I blanch, swinging back to look at Imogen who tilts her chin up at me with a glare. You did what? It's a struggle to keep the flare of anger out of my tone. It was on the mat, Zayden. She shrugs, like that's all that matters, like I'm concerned for her safety. I stayed within the codex. Imogen. Garrick says her name like a curse, hitting his hand on the table so hard that she jumps. She's Brennan's sister. You didn't need to break her fucking shoulder. Imogen's eyes flare and her hand tightens around the hilt of her dagger. I don't care whose sister she is. Her mother murdered my family. She deserves whatever she gets in here. Garrick flings his arms up in the air, his hands clenching into fists. Fuck, Imogen, this is not who we are. We don't punish kids for the crimes of their parents. The unspoken words hang in the air around us. That would make us just like them. Her jaw clenches, but she's too furious to admit that she's wrong. She's a fucking cheat, Garrick. She was wearing some sort of impenetrable armour. And how the fuck would you know that if you weren't breaking the same rules? He roars back, looking at me for backup. Enough! I shout holding up one hand. How many times are we going to have this conversation, Imogen? Keep your fucking emotions out of challenges. One of these days it's going to get you killed. And there are enough ways for us to die in here without our own stupidity getting in the way of it. Not likely, she mutters, and starts to toss the dagger in the air, spinning it and catching it by the hilt. Shadows whip out and snatch it out of the air mid-turn, carrying it suspended across the room and placing it in front of Garrick on the table. Imogen tracks it with her eyes and then turns to me, glaring. Look, I say, pinching the bridge of my nose. We don't know where Sorengale fits into all this yet, and until we do, we need to be smarter. And for fuck's sake, stop showing everyone the best place to land a few hits, Garrick adds exasperated, but his eyes are soft as he looks at Imogen. Even I can tell he's worried about her. Imogen lets out a muffled scream of frustration and falls back on the bed, staring up at the ceiling. Silence stretches out, filling the room. I fucking hate it here, she says quietly, an admission to the room rather than us. I gesture to Garrick with a glance, who moves to sit down beside her on the bed, pressing the dagger back into her hand like a peace offering. I take his vacated seat, my head resting heavily on my hand watching them. We all hate it here, Imogen, but killing won't make it any better. Trust me. She props herself up on her forearms to look back at me. I know. You're right. I just really wanted to kill her. If anyone's killing her, it's me, I say. I'm sure as hell not going to tell Brennan I let someone murder his little sister on my watch. It either happens by my own hand or not at all. If she poses a genuine threat, 
I'll handle her. Imogen stares at me like she doesn't believe me, then finally nods, dropping her head to let it fall back on the bed. Garrick moves his hand like he intends to reach out and comfort her, and I cover a smile as his fists clench, settling back into his lap when he thinks better of it. I send my shadows snaking out to check on Violet in the infirmary, skirting along the walls and slipping under closed doors until I make it to her bedside. Having suffered the same injury during my foster years, I fully expect her to already be unconscious from the pain or screaming bloody murder, but they must have given her something for the pain already because she's completely off her head, her eyes unfocused and slurred words almost undecipherable. Etos is there with her. Of course he is. We have to use this opportunity to get you out. Walking out of here and going straight to the scribe quadrant is your best chance at survival. His panic is thick and palpable, pacing up and down by her bedside. He genuinely cares for her. But you can't just walk out of the rider's quadrant. You fly out on a dragon or leave in a body bag. There are no takebacks. That's not how this works. And Violet knows it too. She glares at Etos, managing to pack a surprising amount of rage into her expression given her condition. I'm not leaving the Rye Eiders just so Mom can and throw me back. I'm staying. Even though the words are slurred, it's an unguarded insight into what brought her here. Her mother is behind this one way or the other. She's only here on her orders. Please, Vi, Etos begs her. Please switch quadrants. If not for you, then for me. Because I didn't step in fast enough. I should have stopped her. I can't protect you. He clearly has no skin in this fight. If Violet's been sent here as a spy, she's working alone. I marred my choice, she says, taking a deep breath. Nolan is hovering behind her, waiting to mend her shoulder. I leave before I can hear her scream. This is the end of chapter 5. However, given how short these chapters are, let's do a double feature and do chapter 6 as well. Enjoy. Zarden P.O. V. Fourth Wing. By Bell. B.B. Chapter 6. Shadows. This night always takes such careful planning, even with every rebellion kid sworn to secrecy. There's over 40 of us in Basgoyeth now, almost double last year, and we can't gather in groups larger than threes without it being considered an act of treason against Navarre. It takes longer than it should to coordinate, relying on a handful of us finding enough quiet moments to whisper instructions to the first years in a way that causes the least suspicion. My stomach is in knots as I walk silently with Imogen along the riverbank winding towards the trees we've picked as this year's rendezvous point. It's difficult to concentrate. My shadows spread out through the quadrant, trying desperately to ensure everyone makes it out without alerting anyone to their absence. I only realise we're at the trunk of the oak tree when Imogen lowers the hood of her cloak, the bright flash of pink hair catching my eye. Did everyone make it out? She asks, her eyes fearful. Yes, I say, and she physically untenses, letting out a long-held breath. There's just so many of us. It makes me nervous. What if... She trails off, and I know she is thinking about last year. The dead eyes of the boy whose neck she'd snapped when he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Your signet makes it easier now, I remind her. Between us we're a formidable duo for this sort of operation. My shadows can get them out, and she can wipe the memories of anyone that sees us along the way. She nods tight-lipped and looks out towards the river. I follow her gaze to watch the other rebellion kids follow the same path we just took. There's the smallest snap of a branch above me, and my shadows edge out, winding around the tree on instinct. Noises in the forest are nothing to worry about, particularly not at night with countless animals scurrying through its depths. I flinch when my shadows find Sorengale clinging tightly to the trunk, just a few feet above us. My stomach twists. Gods! Was I right about her all along? I should kill her now, yank her down from the tree onto the ground in front of everyone as they arrive. Fuck, no. Spy or no spy, I could never face Brennan again after I murdered his sister in a public execution. If I'm forced to kill her, I'll do it one on one, just so I can live with myself afterwards. My shadows thicken around her. It doesn't matter what she hears at this meeting. She won't live to report it back to command. But the shadows pause, 
whispering back to me and taking on a mind of their own. Look at the bag tied to her waist, they strain. It's filled with berries, they urge. They snake up the tree without my direction, spreading out to the topmost branches, where more of these same purple berries hang heavy on the ivy winding through the tree's canopy. I have absolutely no idea what to make of it. What possible reason could she have to be out in the middle of the night picking berries in the forest? But it hardly fits the story of her as a spy for her mother either. Do I really think that she somehow discovered the location of this secret meeting and got hungry while she waited for us all to arrive? And then it dawns on me. There's a very simple way to know exactly what side she's on here. If I let her hear just enough, I can see how she reacts at the end of it. I've always been good at reading people. It won't take long for her to spill her secrets when I have a dagger to her throat. And if they find out we're meeting... The small, scared voice of one of the first years brings me back into myself. The rebellion kids spread all around me in a half circle. We've done this for two years, and they've never found out, I reassure her, resting my back against the lowest branch of the tree. They're not going to, unless one of you tells. And if you tell, I'll know. I'll know because we'll all be dead, but it never hurts to stretch the scope of your abilities. Like Garrick said, we've already lost two first years to their own negligence. There are only 41 of us in the rider's quadrant, and we don't want to lose any of you, but we will if you don't help yourselves. The odds are always stacked against us, and trust me, every other Navarian in the quadrant will look for reasons to call you a traitor and force you to fail. The quiet murmurs of assent do not fill me with much confidence. How many of you are getting your asses handed to you in hand to hand? I ask, not wanting to know the answer. Some like Liam had more freedom to build stamina and bulk, but from the look of others I know their foster situation wasn't as lucky. Four hands shoot into the air. Shit. That's more than I feared. Garrick sighs. I'll teach them. No, I can't have that. Garrick is barely getting enough sleep as it is, sneaking out most nights to other quadrants in Basquiat and the nearby outposts to loot as many weapons as he can get. You're our best fighter, I counter, shaking my head. You're our best fighter, says Bodhi. Dirtiest fighter, maybe, Imogen snarks. The second and third year riders laugh and Liam grins, nodding his frantic agreement at that assessment. I smile too, feeling more at ease and with friends than I have in weeks. Fucking ruthless is more like it, Garrick adds. Garrick is our best fighter, but Imogen is right up there with him, and she's a hell of a lot more patient, I say. Imogen's lips twitch with the compliment. So the four of you split yourselves up between the two of them for training. A group of three won't draw any unwanted attention. What else is giving you trouble? I can't do this. I search the crowd to find the quiet, thready voice. Bran, one of the first years, who is woefully thin, with dark circles around his eyes. Frankly, I'm surprised he survived the parapet. What do you mean? But I already know what he's going to say. There's been one each year, and they've never made it past threshing. I can't do this. His eyes are white with fear. The death, the fighting, any of it. A guy had his neck snapped right in front of me on assessment day. I want to go home. Can you help me with that? I don't take my eyes off him, but feel every head turn to look at me. No, I shrug. You're not going to make it. Best accept it now and not take up more of my time. I ignore the gasps around the group, already mentally striking the boy's name off my list as I look away from him. Two years here has taught me how to compartmentalize. I cannot afford to split my focus any more than it is already. That was a little harsh, cousin, Bodhi chides. What do you want me to say, Bodhi? I can't save everyone, especially not someone who isn't willing to work to save themselves. Damn, Zayden. Garrick rubs the bridge of his nose. Way to give a pep talk. If they need a fucking pep talk, then we both know they're not flying out of the quadrant on graduation day. Let's get real. I can hold their hands and make them a bunch of bullshit empty promises about everyone making it through if that helps them sleep. 
but in my experience, the truth is far more valuable. I eye the first year again, willing him to hear me, to rise to this challenge even when it's hard. But this outburst isn't really for him. It's for the rest of the first years who might have a shot and desperately need to understand that it only gets harder from here. In war, people die. It's not glorious like the bards sing about either. It's snapped necks and 200-foot falls. There's nothing romantic about scorched earth or the scent of sulphur. This, I gesture all around us, back towards the citadel, isn't some fable where everyone makes it out alive. It's hard, cold, uncaring reality. Not everyone here is going to make it home. Shit. I suddenly remember Sorengail in Tree. That is not a secret I am willing to risk her knowing just yet. To whatever's left of our homes, I add limply, and make no mistake, we are at war every time we step foot into the quadrant. So if you won't get your shit together and fight to live, then no, you're not going to make it. I expect him to cry or give me some bullshit about trying, but there's just deafening silence. Now, someone give me a problem I can actually solve. I say. Battle brief, Chelsea pipes up and my pulse races, shadows tensing in case she says a little too much. It's not that I can't keep up, but the information... She trails off with a shrug. That's a tough one, Imogen responds, looking to me pointedly. Help them, it seems to say. Prove you're not a cold-hearted asshole who cares if they make it here but I'm acutely aware of Sorengale listening to every word in the branches above us. You learn what they teach you, I reply, skirting an edge that would reveal the whole truth. Keep what you know, but recite whatever they tell you to. I look around the group, each face staring at me in grim set lines. Anyone else? You'd better ask now. We don't have all night. When do we get to kill Violet Sorengale? asks Kobe a hulk of a first year at the back of the group. My shadows wrap around her closer in the tree at the sound of her name. I know she'll have heard that. If she is innocent in all this, I really don't want to give her any more reasons not to trust us. Yeah, Zayden, Imogen says icily, her eyes narrowed. When do we get to finally have our revenge? I return her glare, knowing she's testing me in front of everyone and is determined I make the same promise to her in front of everyone, so I'm held to it. I told you already, the youngest Sorengale is mine, and I'll handle her when the time is right. Didn't you already learn that lesson, Imogen? Body says. What I hear, Atos has you scrubbing dinner dishes for the next month for using your powers on the mat. Imogen swings that same glare on him. Her mother is responsible for the execution of my mom and sister. I should have done more than just snap her shoulder. Her mum is responsible for the capture of nearly all our parents. Not her daughter, Garrick counters, folding his arms across his chest. His jaw is clenched tight, and I know he's pissed at having to repeat the same conversation as the other night. Punishing children for the sins of their parents is the Navarian way, not the Tyrish. I feel that land among the gathered cadets, but Imogen still doesn't drop it. So we get conscripted because of what our parents did years ago and shoved into this death sentence of a college. In case you didn't notice, she's in the same death sentence of a college. Garrick fires back. Seems like she's already suffering the same fate. I look at everyone gathered around us, see their eyes soften a little as the vengeance drains away and is replaced with something close to pity. In just a few well-chosen words, Garrick has made them see her not as easy prey to exact their revenge, but as an innocent victim just like them. Caught in the crossfire of a war none of us chose to fight. He's always been so much better at this stuff than me. Gods, I hope she's worth our faith. When Imogen looks like she still won't let it rest, I interject. Don't forget her brother was Brennan Sorengale. She has just as much reason to hate us as we do her. I look pointedly at Imogen and Kobe, hoping the implication lands. She could be as innocent in all this as he is, and until we know, no one touches her. And I'm not going to tell you again. She's mine to handle. Anyone feel like arguing? Silence. Good. 
then get back to bed and go in threes. I watch them go, cloaking them in shadows the best I can as they head closer to the citadel. I hear Violet draw in a long, shaky breath above me. She won't come out until I leave. She's not stupid. So I walk away, following the same path as the others, and allow my shadows to envelop me in the darkness, then loop back round to stand a few paces back in the tree line. She waits a long time. I'll give her that. But when she eventually jumps the last four feet to the grass, I spear out a shadow to grab her round the waist before she can even fully stand up. My arm is around her neck, and I have her locked tight against my chest before she can blink. Scream, and you die, I whisper in her ear, replacing my elbow with a dagger, pushing the tip at her throat. Fucking Sorengail. I still have her pinned against my chest, but she has the gall to demand, How did you know? Let me guess, you could smell my perfume. Isn't that what always gives the heroine away in books? It's such an innocent, unexpected question that a short laugh escapes me despite all my suspicions. I command shadows, but sure, it was your perfume that gave you away. I release her, lowering the knife and stepping back a few steps to look at her. Her mouth is on the floor. Your signet is a shadow wielder. The sheer shock and awe in her expression makes my brow raise. Interesting. If she's been sent here as a spy, she's clearly not been briefed on her enemy. It feels less likely than ever that it's why she's here, despite her climbing trees and listening to private conversations in the middle of the night. But surely Etos would have told her. What was that performance in the rotunda about last week if he's not been telling her to keep her distance? What? Etos hasn't warned you not to get caught alone in the dark with me yet, I say, silkily. She grabs a dagger from the sheath at her thigh and spins to face me, but her grip is all wrong and her stance is off. She couldn't stab me with that if she tried. Is this how you plan to handle me? She challenges. Eavesdropping, were we? Like I didn't already know she was listening to every word. Now I might actually have to kill you, I say, studying her reaction. But I'm already sheathing my dagger back at my chest. Then go ahead and get it over with. She takes out another dagger and walks backwards. Her arms are held out a few inches too wide. She's left her body exposed to an attack. I look from one dagger to the other and say, That stance is really the best defence you can muster. No wonder Imogen nearly ripped your arm off. I'm more dangerous than you think, she spits back at me, one arm rising even further back. So I see. I smirk, enjoying how her eyes burn when she's riled. I'm quaking in my boots, I add, intrigued to see what she does when that fire is stoked. She flips the daggers and flings them past my head, and I hear the unmistakable sound of metal splitting wood. I could tell just from the way her body moved that she was never going to hit me, but my pulse picks up just the same. I don't move, my eyes locked with hers as they blaze with rage. You missed, did I? She tilts her head to the side as she reaches for two more daggers. Why don't you back up a couple of steps and test that theory? That piques my interest, but I school indifference onto my face. I step backwards, my back hitting the tree and the cool metal hilt of the daggers brushing against my ears. Tell me again that I missed, she says, her voice lethal as she flips one of her daggers to repeat the same move. Well, what do you know? She's not easy prey or innocent victim after all. She's just as deadly as the rest of us, hiding in plain sight. Fascinating. You look all frail and breakable, but you're really a violent little thing, aren't you? My lips curve into a smile as I mould my shadows into fingers and pull the blades from the tree, dropping them into my hands. Like always, I watch the effect on people as I reveal just how lethal my signet can make me. These shadows aren't just darkness, aren't just lurking in dark corners listening. They will bend to my will and take on any shape, smother the life out of someone on my command. Most people physically shrink back, their eyes going wide in fear, but not Violet. I can't read the look in her eyes as I push my back from the tree and walk towards her, her hands switching the grip on her daggers to prepare for close combat, even knowing I could kill her before she had the chance to blink. I hold the daggers out to her and say, You should show that little trick to Jack Barlow. I'm sorry? 
she lifts her daggers higher, not willing to let down her defences. Good, she's smarter than most. I move closer to her until the tip of her blade presses against my stomach. The neck snapping first year who's very publicly vowed to slaughter you, I clarify. Reaching under her cloak to slide the first blade into the sheath at her outer thigh, she stares up at me, eyes crackling with rage, but when she makes no move to stab me, I pull back the side of her cloak to sheath the other at her ribs and paws. Her hair is stark against the black of her leather vest, the silvery strands braided together and seeming to glint in the moonlight. I knew she'd kept her hair long, but it's always been pinned up at her head. This feels different, like it's a tiny piece of her amid everything this place strips from you. She looks like the violet I imagined when Brennan told me stories about her. And now she's real. But she's her, and she's not her. The violet in his stories was all soft and sweet. This violet has an edge, her eyes sparking with an intensity that says, you won't know what she's capable of until you push her. I stare at her hair for a breath too long and then sheathe the dagger at her ribs. He'd probably think twice about plotting your murder if you threw a few daggers at his head. Because the honour of my murder belongs to you? She challenges. You wanted me dead long before your little club chose my tree to meet under, so I imagine you've all but buried me in your mind by now. Her dagger is still poised at my stomach. Do you plan on telling anyone about my little club? I stare at her, needing to see the truth in whatever answer she gives me. If she tells, she's dead. We all are. No, she says simply. There's no fear in it. She's not saying no because she knows that's what I want to hear. She means it. I'm sure of it. Why not? I tilt my head to one side trying to figure out where her loyalties lie, wondering if she even knows the rules. It's illegal for the children of separatist officers to assemble in groups larger than three. I'm well aware. I've lived at Basquiat longer than you, she snaps at me. And you're not going to run off to Mommy or your precious little Dane and tell them we've been assembling. Atos would use this against us in a heartbeat, clinging to the Codex, like it's all that matters in the world. You were helping them. I don't see why that should be punished. And in that moment, I can feel in my core that she is one of the good ones. That just like her brother, she can see the difference between rule and order and right and wrong. She is nothing like her snivelling snake of a best friend. And she is certainly not here on her mother's mission. I'm not going to tell, she insists. I believe her. I stare at her like I can see inside her head. Something deep within me tells me that I'm going to need her. Maybe not today, not now, but soon. And that just because I have decided to trust her doesn't mean she trusts me. She has too many people pouring poison and prejudices into her ears. I'm going to have my work cut out for me to keep her neutral in this war, let alone on our side when the world falls apart. Interesting, I say finally. We'll see if you keep your word, and if you do, then unfortunately, it looks like I owe you a favour. I turn and walk back towards the citadel before she can argue. You're not going to handle me? She calls after me. Not tonight! I shout back, imagining the gawk on her face. She scoffs. What are you waiting for? I have absolutely no idea. It's no fun if you expect it, I make up on the spot. Now get back to bed before your wing leader realises you're out after curfew. What? I can practically hear her jaw drop. You're my wing leader. I smile secretly to myself, wrapping the shadows around me. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this double feature and let me know if it's something I should keep doing. If you enjoyed these chapters, leave, like or subscribe for more. Cheers.